Our guest this afternoon is the reigning, defending, undisputed champion of second century alternative Christianities and this show, Dr. M. David Litwa. So, Dr. Litwa, welcome back. Great, great to be back, Jason. I'm so glad you are getting back into the swing of things. I think your channel is great and ready to grow. So let's do it. This topic tonight is something that we've had a lot of discussions about. Of course, I'm talking about Alexandria and one of your most recent book releases uh, titled Early Christianity in Alexandria from its beginnings to the late second century. So tell us a little bit about the methodology you employ in the book. Well, the methodology, it's really about a story, and a story which I'm trying to tell was a story that Walter Bauer tried to tell in 1934. His great book called Orthodoxy and Heresy set the stage for a new way of thinking about early Christianity in which it wasn't the case that Orthodox mythology was allowed to dominate, you know, where Jesus died and then gave the gospel to the apostles and the essentially the apostles creed was preached from day one and the church grew and then later all of these nasty things called heresies came in to pollute the pure stream of gospel truth what bauer showed us is that there is a kind of conflict model that starts from the very beginning in different areas of the Roman Empire, and different areas of the Roman Empire grow in different ways. And what we call heresy, sort of anachronistically, was actually dominant in many areas. And he mentioned places like Edessa and Rome and Antioch and North Africa. And I think his chapter on Egypt or Alexandria specifically is great, but it's actually one of the weakest chapters in the book. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to tell that story. I'm trying to expand, first of all, but I'm trying to tell that story with our new paradigm shift. And in that new paradigm shift, we get beyond the categories of orthodoxy and heresy, which are anachronistic anyway, and they're more like insider categories. You know, in the early days, no one introduced themselves as orthodox and no one introduced themselves as, hello, I'm a heretic. They didn't know that they were that. They didn't know that they would be labeled that. So for us to continue to use those categories is a responsible use of insider language and insider terms, when what we're trying to do is to understand how people developed sociologically in a way that, you know, is obviously looking at their theology. I'm interested in theology and and historical theology, but I'm more interested in making sure that I'm laying down my cards at the table and I'm saying to everybody, you know, I'm not inside of how the Christians tell the stories about themselves. I'm outside of that story. I'm a historian. I'm, I'm in my own time and space. I have my own horizon. And I want to tell you how I think it went in a more sociological vein, right? So that's really the goal. The goal is really not to use those loaded terms at all and just to express history in more neutral terms and to understand how things developed in a way that is outside of the religious categories of our subjects in a way that we can understand sociologically in the 21st century. You know, this isn't a horse race. You know, I'm not saying one party won, one party lost. It's more like a chorus. And that chorus is, you know, cacophonous. People are singing at different levels and out of tune. No one is ahead of the other. No one seems to be, you know, in the vast majority. They are all together, though. They're all learning from each other, and they're all competing in a vast marketplace. Sort of like YouTube today, right? (laughs) So if you want an analogy, you know, you can think of the laboratory or the jungle, but you can also think of YouTube. I mean, it's this great cacophonous cacophony of people competing for the interest and attention of others and, you know, trying to make a living uh, doing it, you know, for many of us. So that's kind of how ancient Alexandria was. No one is clearly in the lead and we don't know how the story ends. And so the way that I tell the story is I'm trying to convince you that we should not tell the story from the perspective of the winners. Alexandria is this hotbed of cosmopolitan intellectual ideas. You are bringing together a multitude of sources and stitch them together to create this portrait of a dynamic 
intellectual landscape. And that's what I'd like to talk about a little bit. You bring up everything from Philo to Apollos and Paul's epistles. You use, the, of course, the anti-heretical diatribes. Even the Nag Hammadi Library and Apocryphal Acts of Virtue, you bring all this wonderful source material to the Oasis. So let's start at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about Philo of Alexandria and how he's a precursor to these Christian intellectuals. Philo is a Jewish intellectual, but the Christians later baptize and adopt him. And he's doing similar intellectual activity that later Christians came to do a hundred years later. So he is basing his intellectual project on a biblical or scriptural text, but he's doing Alexandrian philosophy. He's probably teaching in a school setting. He probably has a close-knit group of students probably that meet in his house, and they do essentially exegesis together. That is the close reading and interpretation of scriptural texts in terms of the science of the day. And it takes Christians a long time to get to the level of sophistication of Philo, but they do eventually attain that in the second century. And ironically, after 117, the Jews had lost their intellectual stronghold on the cultural scene, not for any reason of lacking intellectual stamina, but because the Jews were literally wiped out in a massacre that took place in 117. Here's another figure, Apollos, from Paul's epistle to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. Uh, the early Jesus movement seemed to spring up really intellectual, smart people from Alexandria, like Apollos. You note in the book that there are several things in Paul's epistles to the Corinthians that clues them. Maybe Apollos didn't consider Paul on on the same level and vice versa. He almost comes off to me as like a precursor to these later second century Alexandrian theologians, somebody like a Carpocrates or a Basilides, just in terms of the intellectual currents and interchange with Hellenic philosophy. And tell us a little bit about Apollos. How is he different and how Paul portrays him in First Corinthians versus how he's portrayed in the book of Acts? Well, Apollos could have become a heretic but the way that later Christians chose to remember him is they chose to remember him as being included in Paul's story and being subordinate to Paul. Apollos was one of those other missionaries, most of whom are unnamed, who were competitors of Paul and who marketed a different gospel, that is a, a different message about Jesus, that was very powerful in its own time and apparently very influential at Corinth and probably informed by rhetorical and oratorical and philosophical backgrounds more than Paul had to offer. I mean, Paul had a certain level of sophistication, but I think that from Apollos' perspective, he was definitely in the minor leagues while Apollos was in the major leagues. It's sort of like, you know, someone who's Harvard educated here in the Boston area, and is, you know, beginning a YouTube channel, and they're competing with someone who, you know, is educated, but they're sort of like from, I don't know, you know, a, a smaller college, a four-year liberal arts school that, you know, people haven't really heard of. And, you know, there's just a different caliber to the message is a different caliber to the the kind of quality. And they're both saying some similar things, but for whatever reason, in terms of the long view of history, yeah, the Harvard educated oratorically proficient guy, his YouTube channel gets lost and all the videos and the data are erased. But then the kind of the mid grade YouTuber, you know, all his videos or a good number of them are preserved for posterity. And everyone then says this mid-grade guy was the genius and the smart and sophisticated guy, you know, he becomes the subordinate. That's sort of what seems to have gone on. I suspect Apollos wrote things, but they are not preserved. But one of the things that he tells us, and one of the things that it's important for the book, is he tells us that, yes, yes, 
you know, Christian theology was being invented at the time, but it didn't have to start from scratch. You had this Jewish philosophical culture. And so what Apollos brought to the table was something very sophisticated, even in the mid-first century, things like complex thoughts about the resurrection, probably complex thoughts about the nature of Jesus's resurrection, complex thoughts about the nature of wisdom and certain secrecy motifs. We only overhear some of these things through Paul's letters, and Paul himself seems to want to defeat Apollos by essentially, if you can't beat him, join him. So Paul starts presenting himself as a mystagogue, and that's a very interesting move, and Paul presents himself as a philosopher of the resurrection. But these are probably things that Apollos had already done in Corinth. So, yeah, extremely important. And on my own channel, I've got a two-part video on Apollos. So go check that out. I wish more people would recognize him. You know, I like Paul, but I still continue to believe that the star of Apollos, if we are thinking historically, rose much higher than the man of Tarsus. I wanted to return to the relationship that is in flux between the Jesus followers and Judaism. There are three texts in particular that you look at. Some apocryphal texts like Apocalypse of Peter, Preaching of Peter, and then of course the Epistle to Barnabas. So from these texts, how complicated would the relationship between the early Jesus movement and Judaism have been in Alexandria? Well, because of the social and political events that occurred between 115 and 117, the great complexity all of a sudden got very simple. So because Jewish synagogues were destroyed and Jews were murdered en masse in 117, the Christians who were left behind had to make certain decisions. And what was probably a very small minority prior to 115 of very deep thinking Gentile theologians became all of a sudden the majority after the pogrom in 117. Probably up until then, there was a whole series of, shall we say, confluence and competition and coordination. And it wasn't all negative. It wasn't all positive. It was just very, very complex. Many devotees of Jesus were ethnically Jewish. Many of these would have been killed, essentially, after 117. And so in Alexandria, at least, what we call the parting of the ways, it was something that was forced on them. It wasn't something that developed naturally. When Christianity took its own direction as a kind of a dominant Gentile movement, that didn't happen in the same way at the same rate of acceleration as it did in Alexandria, but it could do that in Alexandria because of this horrible tragedy. The book as a whole is the greatest hits of all the unsung early theological and philosophical minds of Alexandria Christianity. These found Christianities, as one of your earlier works was titled. So let's discuss some of them. If you're taking the great tradition line, when we think of Alexandrian Christianity, the big intellectual minds that immediately spring up are, of course, Clement, Origen. However, you make the case in your book that there were even earlier teachers and theologians. Who were some of these earliest Christian teachers in Alexandria? That's right. Since the days of Eusebius, religious scholars or theologically inclined scholars have preferred to tell the story of Alexandria by skipping essentially from Apollos, if they even notice him, all the way to Demetrius, who supposedly becomes bishop in 189. And the earliest thinkers and heroes that Eusebius mentions are Pantinus, Clement, and Origen, and all of these are quite late in the uh, second century. So they leave this gigantic hole in the middle. And even though Eusebius does mention earlier figures like Basilides, 
and Valentinus, as well as Carpocrates, he passes over them and stigmatizes them as heretics, and that gives him the right to ignore them and to ignore the succession that they had. Eusebius never mentions that Carpocrates had a son and a disciple. He never mentions that Vasilides had a son, Isidore, and a succession in terms of his teaching. Eusebius never mentions Carpocrates' most famous disciple, who is actually a woman by the name of Marcelina. And he doesn't take any interest in the wild proliferation of Valentinus' disciples, some of whom we know because Clement of Alexandria excerpts, and he excerpts from a, a Valentinian called Theodotus, who was presumably living in Alexandria. And Eusebius doesn't really pay any attention to Apelles, who is Marcion's most famous disciple, who also comes to Alexandria. So essentially, there's this black hole in the depictions, in the historical tellings of early Christianity in Alexandria, and basically everything from the year 60 to the year 180 is not told. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to convince people that we have sources and that we shouldn't allow this black hole to continue. And we should not so quickly follow the orthodox traditional narrative and simply skip over all these very important people. People like Vasilides, Carpocrates, and Valentinus, these are the very first Christian theologians. Let me repeat that point because that's a really, really important point. These are the very first known Christian theologians who are at a rank and a station that is intellectually and in terms of the rigor and sophistication, they are two to three steps above anything Paul ever wrote or even anything Paul ever thought. I mean, I know that a lot of people want to make Paul into the great theologian, and I'm not trying to diminish Paul's theological mind, but the great geniuses of Christianity are these unsung heroes because their memory has been stigmatized. But they are the first, and they set the pattern for all future time. I think that what strikes me about putting these thinkers who box as a heretic over orthodox, not only does it tend to stigmatize them in terms of being a part of a tradition, it also diminishes the many, many differences and the wonderful synergy and back and forth going on in their thought. They don't all agree. They all have vastly different ideas sometimes about theology and cosmogony. Just a figure that is a kind of a favorite of mine that I've come to really find fascinating is Julius Cassianus and how he was really giving the Valentinians, which he identified as, like he was giving them a hard time. He didn't agree with them. He was technically one of them. I wanted to talk about the Carpocratians, Carpocrates, uh, Pippinese, and Marcelina for a bit. Why are they so important? Thankfully for all your viewers, the book on Carpocrates, Marcelina, and Epiphanes is in paperback. So it is actually affordable. <laughs> Thank God. So if you want to check that out, please do. It's a very kind of academic sort of monograph where I take you through the sources. I don't try to hide things. I take you right through the short sources. I show you exactly what they say. I translate them. I put them in columns. So you'll be able to read everything that we know about them. But yeah, Carpocrates is, again, he's often viewed as something sometimes more than a, like a Platonist philosopher or a, a Neo-Pythagorean philosopher. But he was religious and he was a Christian and he had found a way to completely meld Neo-Pythagorean thought with his Christianity so that 
Jesus was very much like Pythagoras, a kind of enlightened soul who came to earth, not because he needed to, but because he came here to teach and he had the light of wisdom and his soul was mature. And he taught a path out of the cycle of samsara, to use the Indian terminology. But it's the same basic thing, that this world, it isn't a prison. It's more like a gymnasium. It is an exercise ground to train us in virtue. But we've got to get out of it because it's not our best life. Our life is the life of the soul. Our life is the life of the mind. Our life, our true life, is the life of intellect. And so we all must get on the chariot of the mind and transcend the structures of this cosmos. Carpocrates had a son who was writing philosophical treatises at the age of 16, died of unknown causes at 17, but has left behind the longest fragment from a Carpocration because he was taught by his father. And it's a beautiful treatise basically on Christian communism and about why it is the case that owning property is not God's will and why it is better for Christians to share everything. And it's an argument based on nature. You know, it's natural theology. Nature is the giver. Nature shares. And no one owns nature. And it's lovely. But I think the real hero is actually Marcelina, because Marcelina is, and her, her fame, you know, I'm often surprised by even, you know, feminist scholars who, who don't know Marcelina. Marcelina is the only known female Christian leader of a Christian group. There's no other female in the second century whom we know by name who actually fully leads and manages a Christian group in Rome. And she is trained by Carpocrates. And she's the only one with the vision and the determination and audacity to go to the center of empire to go from the second largest city to the largest city to Rome and start a Carpocratian movement there. And it is from her movement that Irenaeus gathers the data in his report on Carpocrates. And that's why I say, you know, you have to be very, very careful and well-trained in reading heresiology. So, you know, when people try to learn about Carpocrates, they often turn to Irenaeus first without considering Irenaeus' sources and the layers in between the sort of echo upon echo that Irenaeus has access to. But at least he acknowledges that Marcelina was there. The strategy of later Christian writers, the heresiologists like Tertullian and the, the author of the Refutation of All Heresies, they just completely ignore her because they cannot imagine a world in which a woman leads a church movement and a successful one at that. Her accomplishments are immense. And I have an article on her in the Brill Encyclopedia of Early Christianity if you want a short version of her accomplishments. And I've got that also on my Patreon. So check it out. You can become a member free of charge. And I hope you like to scroll because I've got nearly 500 pieces of content on Patreon. So go to town. Yeah. And Marcelina is a really good example of these next figures who take this cosmopolitan Alexandrian intellectual milieu and spread it around the Mediterranean. People like Apelles, who was Marcion's students, people like Valentinus. So I didn't know if you could just tell us about these figures really quickly. I mean, I wish Marcy made it to Alexandria. I think he could have learned a lot. I I think he would have expanded his horizons. And it's really a case of cross-pollination. It's Marcy's student, Apelles, who going to Alexandria picks up 
and learns from the, the Valentinian streams there and learns how to modify Marcinite thought and to repackage it so that it's even stronger than it was. Because, you know, Marcin himself was a very intelligent man, but he's not a philosopher. He doesn't pretend to be a philosopher. He's quite cautious about philosophy. But Apelli's really, his accomplishment is to bring in more philosophical categories about the nature of matter and to bring in more rhetorical and literary kinds of tools and logical tools with which he can critique the stories of the Hebrew Bible. And so he continues the project of Marcion, but in fact, in a much more sophisticated way that is informed, I think, incontrovertibly by his stay in Alexandria. And Apelles is an interesting case because he's probably trained directly by Marcion, probably in Rome, goes to Alexandria, lives there for at least a decade or more, and then returns to Rome. And so by that time, he has expanded on the master's teaching. Yeah, the heresiologists want to say that he's rebelled against Marcion, but I think he always considers himself to be a Marcionite and faithful to Marcion, but just one who had expanded the tradition based on Valentinian ideas. To give just one example, the Valentinian idea of the creator as not an evil being, but a just being, that is a a being who is himself on the road to virtue, isn't evil per se. That's a development of Marcionite thought that actually becomes dominant in Marcionite thought. But that is the development of Apelius and his colleagues who are interacting with Valentinians in Alexandria. And he brings this doctrine back to Rome so that Marcionism changes and is updated for a new generation. And as I said, grows even stronger. Of course, making his triumphant return in the book is the Nothene Preacher. And no discussion of Alexandrian Christianity would be completely dumb. Fittingly, I felt like he's kind of the main event. As we've noted in our previous fantastic discussion about the Nassines, trying to get a clear picture of him and his group is complicated as Pseudo-Hippolytus, or the Refutator, who wrote the refutation of all heresies in the mid-2nd century, is one of our only sources. But if you could just briefly tell us who were the Nassines, who was the preacher Well, here also I can point to another, thankfully, paperback book on the Nassines, and you can get the whole story there. I think they also are unsung heroes, and I am distinctive in placing them in Alexandria. So logically, you know, they find a place in the book in the last chapter. They're probably late second century. But I think that the Nassine preacher is very useful because he illustrates just how dynamic and varied that Alexandrian Christian culture was. The old term for this, and, you know, we we could still use this as syncretistic, but I prefer the term cosmopolitan. There is this distinctive quality of Alexandrian Christianity that, unlike Christianity in other areas, which tended to fear temples and other religious rituals and other cults as the hothouse of the devil. The Nassim preacher, among other Alexandrians, loves those other religious movements and is able to integrate them into his theology and into his story of how God saves the world. So unlike other Christians, he sees Addis and Adonis and Osiris, all as signs and symbols of Christ, as Christ figures. So what other Christians like Justin Martyr do with the Old Testament by typologizing and allegorizing, the Nassim preacher does with other Greco-Roman religions using the tools of etymological exegesis, as I call it, that is looking at the nature of words and expressions and seeing them as signs and symbols of a deeper truth. So he's absolutely a central player and a great example of the sheer vibrancy and dynamism and diversity, as well as the power of Christianity to assimilate everything around it and to live as a successful religious movement. The Nazi preacher, he ticks all the boxes. I haven't seen a figure who 
has this kind of dynamic thought, the sense possible file of Alexandria before. Him. One thing I really loved about your book as well was you incorporate the Nag Hammadi Library. It's another famous collection of texts from an Egyptian milieu, specifically texts like Eunostus and the Wisdom of Jesus Christ. What can these Nag Hammadi texts tell us about the intellectual climate of Alexandrian Christianity? Yeah, well, this is one of the, uh, if I have a legacy and an accomplishment, this is hopefully something that will continue that is integrating Nag Hammadi and Nag Hammadi texts into our story of earliest Christianity. And yes, I mean, we can debate about the texts, but I think you know, after a generation of study, scholars have made the best case possible that Eugnostus is an Alexandrian text. And so then we have to ask, well, you know, what can Eugnostus tell us about earliest Alexandrian theology? And it, it does seem similar to what we find in other thinkers and texts. It, it tends to be on the ascetic side, like we see in the Gospel of Thomas and the, the testimony of truth. It has a fair amount of speculation on a divine human figure that is a human with a capital H who is the true God, and that is the true mystery of the universe, that God is human. And it's very interested in levels of transcendent reality. And it, it really has a very deep fascination with what goes under the name of metaphysics, that is what, what's beyond our universe in a transcendent and supernal realm. And that's an emphasis that it's well ahead of its time. You know, it, it takes other Christians years and years, uh, even, even centuries, to get to that level of, of speculation that we see really, I mean, in so-called Orthodox or early Catholic streams, they really only get to that level of metaphysical sophistication in the fourth century when they're talking about things like how the son emerges from the father and how the spirit proceeds from both son and father you know those deep metaphysical arguments uh, have their seeds in earlier theories like emanationism and emanations of divine entities who come to be as a result of mathematical patterns and that those mathematical patterns then become the models for numbers. And those numbers then are the models for physical realities. So all of this is really laid out in Eugnostus. And again, in the wisdom of Jesus Christ, it's essentially a Christianization of Eugnostus, where the great sermon of Eugnostus, the great philosophical treatise, is, is just put in, into the mouth of Jesus. So it's that kind of material and Nagamani material that I touch on in the epilogue of the book, which is more kind of bridging into the third century, like the Coptic Apocalypse of Peter and the second treatise of great Seth. Those can still, I think, tell us about very late second and early third century Alexandria. And even though a lot of it is fairly cryptic and it has been edited, I think that's no excuse for doing the hard work to see what it can tell us about second century Christianity. And of course, the best known text is the Gospel of Thomas, which I, not distinctively, but I think I, I've done it now at most length to argue for an Alexandrian provenance of the Gospel of Thomas traditions including the Book of Thomas, and I've got just recently now an article in the Journal of Biblical Literature expanding that. But you can get the first fruits in the Alexandria book. All of these different sources that you bring together show a really dynamic, polyphonic, intellectual collection of voices coming together. For me, that's the legacy of this period of time, a group that is in dynamic cultural exchange with their environment, whether that be platonic philosophy or hermeticism or Judaism. We see that in people like the Gnostic preacher. Overall, what is the legacy of second century Alexandrian Christianity for you? You know, our friend Miguel Connor has, as part of his 
show, he, he calls it the virtual Alexandria. And I think, you know, today Alexandria still has great meanings. It's not a thing in the past. It's, it's a thing of the present. Alexandrian Christianity is the promise of a Christianity that is free thinking, that is at the cutting edge of scientific and philosophical learning, that is in tune with cultural currents, able to adapt, able to change, able to assimilate, and isn't afraid of the general culture. You, you hear some Christians today worried about their Christian kids going to college because they're afraid that education will corrupt them. Alexandria represents the exact opposite. Alexandria represents a Christianity that embraces all sorts of Greco-Roman education and that can see Christ in Homer, Christ in Virgil, can see Christ everywhere. That may be taken as a form of cultural appropriation, and you know that's something to consider and to be wary of. But you can't deny the absolute intellectual dynamism and the breathtaking passion of these Alexandrian theologians whose stories remain untold. And I've only tried to whet your appetite. And to all of those out there who you know, don't want to buy an expensive book, I completely understand. Recommend it to your libraries and wait for the paperback. That's fine. You can join Patreon. I can give you a code to save some of your well-earned money. And I have can also get you a deal on the book if you join at a certain level. So don't let that stop you. The point of publishing an academic book in a well-respected press is so that it can go through the peer review process. And unfortunately, yes, that means that the initial hardback edition will be expensive. But hold on, wait patiently, support me so that I can get it on Audible. And by supporting me, you give me time to do those sorts of things. And so I can better serve you with an affordable text. But you'll if you join the Patreon, you'll get you'll get plenty of of information about Alexandria as well. And I think it's around ten dollars a month to get a huge amount of content now. So I hope to see all of you there. And I just want to thank Jason. This is an awesome channel and a treasure. And you know, we have to use organic means of marketing. You know, we depend, Jason depends, I depend on your word of mouth. Good content shouldn't have to depend on the algorithm. But you can show your support by word of mouth, by commenting, by just going crazy with emojis, but especially by sharing. Share these videos, get the word out, support those creators and those channels that are going the extra mile to bring in qualified people. We want to think big here. We want to transform how education is done in this country and around the world. So think big with us. And yeah, you don't need a four-year degree and you don't need to go back to school to get a master's degree. Choose well and support the teachers who are trying to support themselves here in this space and trying to present a new model of education which will add value to you and add value to the world it's our duty to make sure that in this great cacophony there is a clear tune that goes above the crowd and i think this is one of those channels please support it Thank you to all. I really appreciate everything from the bottom of my heart. Well, thank you so much for that. And yes, I would encourage everybody to go out and support the work that Dr. Litwa is doing. This is kind of like the Wild West, pioneering a new way to learn this. Thank you, Dr. Litwa. I always love having these conversations. Thank you for all your hard work. And we'll see you next time. Definitely.